A very good evening and welcome to all of you to this wonderful leadership conversation that we have planned with Gen Lopsangla. Uh, Gen Lopsangla is the founder and director of uh, Jamse Children's Community. Uh, it is our good fortune and, uh, and a great joy and excitement to share the screen with such an exciting personality. Welcome Gen Lopsangla to this conversation. Thank you. Uh, I would like to thank uh, the entire team that uh, helped us get in touch with you uh, for coordination and also sharing lots of information, understanding about uh, what you do. And uh, before that, I also would like to thank uh, Mr. Ravi Santlani. He is the CEO of uh, Screw News. Uh, it's based in Jaipur. Uh, they do a lot of work for the schools as a community. And uh, I would like to especially uh, take his name for connecting me with you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ravi. Uh, we'd like to seek many more such suggestions from you in the future as well. And I welcome you and many others also who have joined uh, for this session. This is the 60th leadership conversation in our journey of webinars or the leadership conversations that we have been having every Friday in the evening. Uh, it is our pleasure today to have all of you with us. I would like to take uh, a moment or so <coughs> to introduce uh, Gen Lopsangla, and uh, after that, I'll hand it over back to uh, Gen Lopsang to start the session with his opening remarks. Allow me to share my screen, please. Yes, uh, today the session is going to be on transformative learning, Buddhist perspectives. We are going to talk about integrating uh, heart, mind, and body. This is uh, going to be a session scheduled for one hour. The first half an hour is introduction as well as talk by the guest. And the next half an hour or so, the Q&A. Uh, the Q&A will be moderated by myself and my colleague, Professor Prasad. This is the leader we have with us, uh, very handsome. Thank you very much. Let me now start this. Uh, this is a very large profile, but I try to condense it to the extent possible. Uh, the goals of uh, Jamse Gaxal Children's Community uh, is to provide children with a secure home, education, medical care, and a lifelong commitment to their well-being from the stage of preschool to postgraduate studies and until they become financially independent. The Jamse educational model is rooted in the three essentials of educating the heart, mind and body so that the children can develop compassion to nurture, wisdom to guide and skill to serve. Gen Lopsang's work is focused on transformative education, sustainable development and social entrepreneurship. Uh, Gen Lopsang Funsok studied Buddhist philosophy and practice at the Seraji Monastery in Mysore, which is well known and a very popular monastery. In the early part of his career in 2000, uh, Gen Lopsang attended the Millennium World Peace Summit organized by the United Nations in New York City. He gave talks at uh, the prestigious Harvard University, Boston University and Clark University, among several other educational institutions in the United States, as well as Carlton University in the Ottawa and University of Calgary in Canada and various other institutions in Europe. Uh, through his extensive travel and talks across the world, Gen Lobsang established learning centers in the United States and Canada and founded the Jamse Buddhist Centers in Boston. In 2003, Gen Lobsang founded Jamse International, a nonprofit organization in the United States dedicated, the, dedicated to educating the heart, mind, and body, the three essentials of the 21st century. In 2006, Ken Lobsang left behind his life as the founder and director of Jamse International. He's a spiritual teacher and life coach, and he started Jamse Gatsal Children's Community in Lumla, near his hometown in Arunachal Pradesh. The community accepts orphaned and most at risk children from nearby villages to give them a chance at life and success. Today, it has more than 100 children in its care, including 25 graduates who are pursuing uh, higher education in different parts of the country, including Delhi, Bangalore, Pune, Dharmashala, et cetera. There are several uh, ac accomplishments, accolades uh, conferred on uh, Gen Lobsang. Uh, some of them are in 2022, Gen Lobsang is invited for a special audience of uh, transformative educators with Honorable Union Home Minister of India, Mr. Amit Shah, to chart the growth and right development of the educational landscape of Arunachal Pradesh and Northeast India. In 2021, Gen Lobsang was awarded 
uh, the prestigious state gold medal for meritorious service by the government of Arunachal Pradesh presented by His Excellency, the governor of Arunachal Pradesh, Brigadier Dr. B.D. Mishra. In 2019, Gen Lobsang was invited by the Minister of Education of Israel for week-long sessions, seminars, and talks on education, mental health, and well-being of children at risk, uh, uh, well-being of children at risk in the education system. In 2016, uh, Tashi and the Monk, a short documentary film based on Gen Lobsang's life and his work at Chamse Gatsal, wins the Emmy Award for Outstanding Short Documentary Film. I can go on and on. It's a very interesting and a huge profile. I'll stop at this with your permission and I request uh, Gen Lop Sangla to start his opening remarks. Once again, uh, a hearty welcome to you on behalf of ICFI and all the participants today. I request you to kindly start the session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sudhagar, Professor Prasad and ICFI. Thank you everyone who is participating for this discussion today. I'm really honored to be with you today for this discussion. And I realize many of you are from a business background, uh, which I have, I'm very unfamiliar with. And I feel honestly a little bit uh, uncomfortable to speak today. I've been thinking about how I can find a common ground where we all can relate and discuss and make this session a little more um, engaging and uh, uh, more engaging and interactive. But I was also at the same time so excited that no matter what, being human beings, there are so many things we all can relate and we all can uh, talk about. Right now, the situation everywhere, when you look at, well, we are facing so many different challenges. And I, I believe that all of us who are participating today for this discussion is we are doing everything we can from our capacity and limitation to make this world a better and more peaceful for everybody. So again, this is truly an honor to be uh, with all of you. And I will try and I hope, and this is my intention that at the end of session that I could say something useful and meaningful to everyone. So my topic today was transformative learning through integrating heart, mind and body. So this is a, something that I have been talking a lot for so many years. And this is a, something that I believe so strongly that we, we call at our community, the three essentials of 21st century, educating heart, mind, and body. And um, I strongly believe that we all can relate to this. All of us are doing best we can in our own place, in our, with our own limitation, as I mentioned. But I think there is a, a very a common ground that we all share. We all share and we all connect to the, each other. And I can speak from, although I do not have much experience of conducting business or running a business more for the profit, but I think uh, even our community has a business aspect where I could actually share that how and way that we conduct our business the aspect of our community in this remote place. Normally, the way I think is, uh, of course, there is a job which needs to be done, and there is a doer or human or person or doing person who is a doer. Uh, this is a two very important aspects. And in my limited experience that I learned, whether job is important and not so important, whether job is big or small, the well-being of doer, the happiness of doer is very important. As a leader, one of the most important responsibility we have is a taking care of the well-being and happiness and safety of the doer. If leaders can take care 
of the doer. And I think our doers will take care of the job which needs to be done. So in this per perspective, I also think a lot about is, uh, you know, when we, anything that we start, any business or any work we start, often we are so um, uh, focused and sometimes overly focused on job. And sometimes intentionally or not intentionally, we tend to ignore the human aspect of the doing. And we, we ignore the doers, we ignore the human beings, and we tend to focus more on human doing. And that's why like almost every institution is so much focused on training and giving a job skill, the technical skill and basic knowledge to how to conduct a business. And while we, while we do that, and I think at the same, when we forgot, again, there is a human aspect, there is a human being, there is a human being, we ignore that, then unhappiness human beings, the unhappiness employer or unhappiness employer can make unhappiness employees and unhappy employees cannot never deliver what we expect to achieve in a, whether it's in our personal life or whether this is in our business setting. So this is a very important that I feel because what we do in this remote place is a so important first, not to thrive, but first to survive. We are in a very remote place right now that I am in a place called Tejpur because I got stuck because of the rain, heavy rain from last few days. So I'm staying in a hotel and hoping to open the door so I can go up in the Himalaya mountains. And I have to get from the nearest airport is around 17 to 18 hours drive to get where I'm working. So you could imagine that for us is always, the survival is a big question. We often cannot think of thriving because we often have to put so much our energy on how we can survive on a day-to-day -day basis and months and years. So while we do so, there's so many in the last 16, 17 years that I see the impossible things become a possible. And one of the main reasons is I've always found and I always believe strongly is that when leaders take care of the happiness and the well-being of your team, and they really do take care of the job that you wanted them to accomplish and you wanted them to get done. So that's why the educating heart, mind, and body becomes very important to me and very important to us, very important to us. Reason is again, as I said, you know, when whenever we join to any company or any organization, they're always the leaders first focus on let's train, let's, let's train and give the technical skills and basic knowledge to get that a job. But what we think of, what I think of is you see how important it is. If we can, the most important training is leaders can now think of a 21st century is, you know, we have to think in terms of the tool. I think three biggest tool that we all have is our heart, our mind, and our body. These are the three most important tool and most precious tool that we all have as a leader. And we all, all the employees, all the our staff and you know, our team has this. And we need to train that as a leader personally that we, I feel strongly that we need to train how we can use three, this three most important tool, what I call heart, mind, and body, how to regulate it, how to manage it, and how to utilize it in its best and ideal situation. If we as a leader, if we fail to manage this, if we fail to regulate this, if we fail to uh, uh, utilize this in a properly, we could never expect anybody else from our team to do this job well. So the educating heart, educating mind, and educating body becomes so crucial 
So that's why I call it is essential, essential. In the nineties, maybe in the Western world or in a modern world, the term the emotional uh, intelligence becomes very popular. But we as an Indian sometimes we forget this, you know. We didn't call it emotional intelligence, but such a great skills uh, exist in this country for over thousands of years. And somehow we got disconnected from those trainings and practices. And now it's coming through a West. And then we, 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 we often pay more attention when it comes from the West or when it's coming from Europe or when it's coming from America, we tend to pay more attention to it. But now that most of us, we know how important it is to educate a heart, how important it is to educate a heart, because the unhappy person could never, 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 never achieve. Even the simplest thing, you give a tax, most easiest tax to the, your most unhappy uh, staff or employee, you will see that he or she could never achieve this. The happy employee, the happy staff, the happy person or the happy leaders can achieve even the impossible things. They can get done impossible things. So happiness matters. So the mental well-being matters. So the leaders can focus on more actually taking care of the well-being and the health and the safety of people who are working with us and they will take care of that. Otherwise, it will be very difficult. It will, be, it will become more and more difficult to anything to achieve in this world because things are changing so, so, so constantly. Things are changing so constantly. So now I would like to talk a little bit about what I really mean when I, I talk about educating heart, mind, and a body. Most easy thing to think about is educating, educating, educating body is we have so little understanding about educating body. Of course, we talk about somebody, uh, 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 to, to somebody to, to train with the certain sports, maybe the football player, the cricket player, uh, but we don't think there are so many more things that we as an educator or the, the educational leadership can take more responsibility about. And I normally call that in terms of my fingers, my these fingers are some of the most uneducated fingers. Reason when I say that, and we have amazing carpenters in our community. And I, when I travel, we see so many amazing artists how much they can draw and how much beautiful things they can create and build from their fingers. When I look at them, and then when I reflect on my, these fingers, and I feel I have the most uneducated fingers, you know? And the, our emphasis of education is always bring on a small part of the brain, and then we ignore it. So when we look at a one whole person, even for me that I'm thinking about, when I look at my whole person, and my entire body actually, maybe the 95%, more than 95% is uneducated. Is it basically wasted resources sitting there? So basic things, you know, sometimes I even cannot do the basic things when I think the whole physical body, I think about, it. you know, you, from here. So I do feel that my eyes are so uneducated. I was, with, with my friend and he took me to this amazing museum, amazing painting in Europe. And then she was so excited showing everything. And when I look at those uh, paintings, those arts, I couldn't even enjoy and please myself. You know, I look at this, what is this? I don't really I get it. And when she was like with energy and so much enthusiasm and so much exciting that I could see that she's getting goosebumps when while she was trying to explain about piece of that art. And I was just looking at the same piece of art and I was like, you know, basically uh, feeling nothing, basically numb. 
the eventually i learned to see beautiful things through my eyes through educating my eyes through educating my eyes and i know so many people when they come to the remote place like where we exist and they are really difficult to see the beauties in a nature i often let them sit with me under a tree and watch the tree the branches the leaves and they got sober you know after a few seconds they will touch their hands of course they have the same, similar attitude that i gave to my friend is what is there to enjoy what is this this is so boring these are even like simple simple thing when i think about how much i need and more seriously when i look at you see things we see our our own interpretations those are even often limited based on limited information that we have in our mind and we tend to see beautiful ugly we just see you know the positive negative through our eyes there are so many things when it comes to the learning that i talk about the unlearning has to happen before we relearn and learn but so many things i see i have seen is conditioned by the society where i live community i live the country and culture and religion and whatever moment we see and we tend to actually define good bad like dislike positive negative whatever we see so many things that i see in a, a life that in before i educate my eyes so many things i need to unlearn and relearn and then i need to train my eyes to see the beauty and i need to train my eyes to see beyond what is appearance and able to see the beauty and essence beyond beyond the appearance and these are like i talked about each and every part of part of our body and i think about like my ears so many beautiful music i have so many experience of how uneducated ears i have listening to classical western classical music i thought that could be the one that is a one of the most boring things that i could I, i ever heard and but so much your ears are uneducated and so much you need to educate about to 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 listen and and to to hear the beauty to hear the you know the sound everything i think we are we have so so much so the basically as i'm saying maybe the over 95% of our body our our life even our self is totally uneducated and i was recently talking to some of the my colleagues they are from very simple life coming from the mountains and we were traveling and when we were we try something new i was we were trying something to eat a pizza and they thought this was the most horrible food that he or she can have and i was saying you see how uneducated your tongue is you need to educate your tongue you know we are part of this amazing a uh, 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 planet amazing uh, amazing uh, 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 world so you cannot just you know eat always the same food you are eating up in a mountain so you need to educate your tongue you need to educate your taste i said you know your your tongue is so rigid your tongue is very rigid and very uneducated i said you know i enjoy eating this thing so you will be enjoying yeah, you will enjoy eating this. so so educate your tongue don't limit yourself don't limit yourself you know only the good food is the food that i have been eating from since I'm, my childhood but you know expose yourself and you know open yourself so with that openness you know everything we have to open everything that we need to expose ourselves and educate ourselves so we can be the we can provide the best service to 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 the wherever we are uh, wherever we are and educating all these thing tiny things why i'm talking it's is a there is a lot more than just just eating you know different food and listening different music and seeing different cultures and different beauties going beyond the appearance this is the best way of actually connecting and building relationship with different people people from different diverse 
culture, different from different faith and different from, yeah. this is a way to become more compassionate. This is a way to become more openness. And this is a way that we can connect to the different people outside of our own community, outside of our own faith, the outside of our, our own uh, uh, tribe and educating this kind of thing from the very early age, it becomes very uh, crucial, very important to us, you know. And same thing, the educating heart when we talk about, you know, so much of when we talk about our, uh, you know, the educating heart with the compassion has been like very, is very limited with, it's very uh, sort of exclusive compassion. I often call this maybe a, Convenient compassion, you know, whenever it's a con convenient, it's, it's a more a convenient uh, compassion. It's very exclusive that people we like that we practice compassion, but people we don't like, of course, we will never think of practicing compassion on them or even the neutral people it's like, you know, the, who are not our friends or, or our enemies or people we dislike, but even we cannot extend our compassion to the, those people. Our compassions are very exclusive. And for even for very limited people, you know, the exclusive people, and even for them, that our compassion is often uh, uh, a very a convenient compassion. You know, what I mean in a convenient uh, compassion is like, you know, we go to the restaurant, maybe as a birthday, I want to have, go to the best, best restaurant and I want to order my favorite food and we order. And then, you know, we cannot complete, eat all. And there's a leftover. We ask people to pack that. And then we say, okay, let's pack this. And I want to give to somebody outside. And, and we think that is a compassion, but that's very convenient. It's a convenient a compassion because it's actually we are doing, making convenient for ourselves. The real compassion, should be more inconvenient if we can practice compassion when the situations are very inconvenient to us. And then we could tell that I am truly a compassionate person or I do have a very a compassionate heart. But most of the time that we practice only the convenient uh, compassion. We don't really I give the best that, uh, you know, the best thing, the best food that we like. And we always look for the very convenient uh, uh, way to practice uh, compassion. So these are for, you know, the uh, educating, uh, 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 educating heart is important from, I, I strongly believe from the very uh, young age. As we get older and these are, are you know, these, they, they become harder and more uh, uh, difficult for us to, uh, us to uh, train and, uh, and a practice. But if we uh, emphasize or focus on training for, from the young age, uh, from the very school level, I think these future generation will definitely become more uh, compassionate and kind and caring when they, when they, when they grew up. So these are certain aspects uh, 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 we focus in our, our community. And I think this is also very applicable to wherever uh, uh, we, we, we go. And uh, you know, Sudhakar, maybe you, we can turn this into more uh, question and answer session. It will be more uh, yes. engaging and helpful instead yes. of becoming uh, sure. Uh, thank you, uh, Genla. Uh, I think uh, this conversation is going to begin now in terms of Q&A. But in the opening remarks, I am extremely thankful to you for putting forth in such simple terms, in terms of what we come across in our day-to-day -day life, examples of what we look at, examples of how we limit our own mind and body. We restrict ourselves without harnessing the potential of our mind and body and therefore our, our multiplier force is something which we are losing, which we are not able to actually function fully. In fact, in your own words, you mentioned that 
90% or 95% of our body is uneducated or our heart is uneducated and it is limited to that extent. So with proper training and uh, right interventions at early stage, we are all uh, game for building a future generation that is so caring and kind. And most of the problems that we come across in our day-to-day -day life, while we are talking, the problems that we are facing around the country and around the world are largely rooted in problems of lack of uh, appreciating diversity, which you very rightly mentioned, uh, Genla, that uh, when we connect to people outside of our community, people who do not look like us, people who do not think like us, people who eat something else compared to us, that is accepting diversity and being inclusive. And that's where we all work together and uh, work in cohesion to build a world that is much, much peaceful and happier to live for all of us. I think that's a fantastic message uh, that you have given. Uh, with this as basis, uh, we will now progress for the Q&A session. I request uh, uh, Professor R. Prasad to join. Uh, Professor R. Prasad uh, is my esteemed colleague. Uh, he brings with himself uh, a rich experience of three decades in uh, entrepreneurship, academic world, and the corporate world put together. Uh, he's the director of Academic Wing and also professor and mentor for the online MBA program. Welcome, Professor Prasad, and uh, I request you to start uh, the Q&A session with the first cluster. I will join uh, once you complete that session. Thank you, Professor Prasad. Thank you, Professor Rao. I think I'll take this opportunity to uh, respond to a question which is asked in almost 50% of our webinars. And that is, you know, how does this session help me? And I think I'm, I'm doing that because we want to connect to the business world. And we want to see how this will be useful to uh, people in business. I think a crisis that the world faces today, and it is only increasing, it is not decreasing, is a crisis of ethics, values of people and what they practice. And this discussion has entered the uh, business world. And particularly after the last decade, the 2008 crisis, which was centered around money, I think this has taken center stage and uh, it has been introduced in the form of course, a course in almost uh, all business schools. I think it's also a crisis of uh, leadership when it comes to organizations, when a lot of people feel let down, when somebody gets into the practice of being unethical and uh, all the others who are contributing and who had their values in the right place find that they've been left in the lurch. So I think it's extremely, extremely relevant. We also find from the business field that there's a lot of, uh, lot of literature, a lot of discussion going around purpose. And today organizations are taking pride in declaring their purpose, declaring their values and trying, trying is a key word to see how they can implement it. So I think this trying is where we come in. And I think a lot more needs to be done, not just in business schools where management education is given, but also in the world of practice, where we have our own moments, uh, where we need to be far more human, even though you may be human at the other points, I, sh I feel certainly that all of us pass through those moments when we could have been more human. And I think that's where the, the challenge lies and that's where the entire connect comes. To add to it, uh, there is a very, there is a, a, a values theory in management, which is called the knowing, doing, being theory. And it originated uh, coincidentally with the US Army for leadership training. And it is used in business schools. There is literature where people try to see how are you connecting these three into what you're doing? Because if the centeredness is not there with being coming right in the middle, then the remaining of it is of no use. Just knowing and doing doesn't help. So it becomes the task orientation that Sir was talking about. Too much of task orientation coming in that Sir was talking about. I think these are some points which I just wanted to introduce to say that this is, these are far, far more relevant than, than techniques and methods which we use to become more productive in whatever we do. Because this is a direction. This is human evolution. And I think in today's world, business dominates, money dominates, business drives politics, business is setting the agenda. So therefore, it is extremely important for us to have these discussions and see what little we can take away from each of these. So that is in the form of setting a context and connecting between what Sir said and what uh, we in the world of uh, business, whether in education or in the world of practice, 
uh, look at, sir. Uh, now I come to the first question, sir. The first question is a bit personal. It is about uh, where did you get the motivation to go on this mission and journey, sir? This is a wonderful question. It's the, yeah, maybe we could call a motivation, but it's also sort of a fuel or the energy. See, the human beings, whatever we do, there are so many ways that we can actually get this fuel and energize and motivate us. And some people, they feed a hate to other people and feed themselves a hate and they get energized to do something very uh, destructive. What I feel is when I feed love, love to other people and love feeds me back, and this is every moment, every day, I make sure that I'm feeding love to other people so the love can feed me. It's a constant, you know, the motivation, sometimes it comes, sometimes I become very lazy, even I have a big purpose. But the really the energy, it's like a fuel to the car that constantly I am moving and constantly I'm doing, is I make sure that my real fuel is a love that whoever EM I'm sitting in a restaurant with strangers, I can feed myself. If I feed that person with the love and that person will feed me, the love will feed me back. And I get excited. And you're sitting with a stranger you never met. And in during that short period of the dinner or lunch when you're alone and you can have amazing things you could discuss and you can get done so many things. And, you know, you just, it's constantly is things. So wherever we, we, we uh, I go, so the real energy is coming from, for me is the love. So love what I'm doing. So it doesn't have to be directly related to educating children and feeding children and, and, and you know, uh, 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 supporting them. And that the ingredients is a lot of where, wherever you go. So you make sure that for me, at least it works, because I, I, I don't know, maybe it's a motivation or something, because I always find a way to feed love. So the love always feeds me back. And, and wherever I, I am. So this is my true energy behind. I don't know. Fantastic, the sound sir. <laughs> Fantastic, sir. Fantastic, sir. I think your response has come from the being. It has not come from the knowing or the doing. And I think that what you have told us is actually a practice. It's, it's something that we need to be moment to moment when you're sitting along with somebody else. It's not something that happened to us and it is there in our memory. And I think this practice is something that you are also, I think a lot of our uh, very revered uh, figures in religions and in life say the same thing. And I think you've also talked about it being a state, a state of being rather than it being intellectual an intellectual concept, which a lot of us get into for the purpose of discussion. Sorry, I cannot hear you, Professor Prasad. Yes. Maybe it's my, sorry. Yeah. Is Thank it you. audible, sir? Thank you. Yes. yes. Yes, thank you. Maybe it's my, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, sir. So I think, you know, that, that feeling when we talk to each other is also going to help us in getting to a better outcome and perhaps spread this feeling a bit more than otherwise. Thank you very much, sir. It's a wonderful response to the very first question. Thank you. So the next question is uh, about what we mean by transformative learning in practical terms. You would have done a lot of work in this area earlier and also with respect to children. So can you illustrate what you mean by transformative learning uh, with a certain situation or an instance or a context so that we understand that better? I mean, there can be many ways of, 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 of defining uh, transformative learning. For me is, you know, how you can translate the idea or the knowledge or the values to your life and implement your life and practice it. And through that, the first, the impact is like transforming your own life. You know, the transforming own, your own life, but transforming your body, transforming your mind, transforming your heart. For example, if we say 
the compassion, practice compassion. Oh, compassion, empathy, and compassion is a great idea, you know? But we cannot learn empathy and compassion where we learn how to uh, oper uh, uh, operate computer. It's a very different procedure. It's a very different uh, way of learning. What I, I, I think maybe the, the, the neuroscientists, they call up the, there's a two kinds of learning, the procedural learning and declarative learning. The procedural learning is when we talk about transformative learning, it's we have to cultivate those quality through integrating and implementing, putting into practice. We could learn about compassion reading book, but we, will, we can only learn about compassion, but it's, it won't make us necessarily compassionate person. We can learn about patience, reading a book or listening to the music, uh, listening to the lecture, sorry. But that won't necessarily make us patient person. We will know about the patients. But transformative learning for me is of course, number first that you listen, you, uh, you experience and you, you, you observe. And a second stage is where you have to reflect the real transformating, le transformative learning happens through the self-reflection. It's never to listen. We do not learn, we, can, we do not, cannot learn transformative learning from just listening and observe unless and until we reflect on what information we receive and what we learn from the book. So the reflection is a key for the transformative learning. So as a leader, I think, well, we all are, I'm not talking about leader, it means like you're leading 100 or 1,000 people. We all are leader. We are leader for our children. We are leader for our family. We are leader for our friends. And our, we have a big responsibility of leading our life through examples because we all love our loved ones, our friends. We wish them the best. But best way to actually wish is to transform our own life and lead by example. So we cannot bring the best uh, in other persons. We cannot bring the best in our, uh, uh, others unless and until we bring the best in ourselves. So the transformative learning is uh, something that we need to, uh, uh, we need to, we need to uh, apply. So for example, I, 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 uh, one thing that I, I tell the children in my community is, you know, there is a three ways of smiling because when we get up, it's nice to see somebody smiling at you. It is a very inexpensive, but very, very powerful and precious thing that you can dream of sometimes. Somebody, we all love people looking at us with a smile. We, we all wish, but can we really learn from smile from heart and mind and body? This is something I feel so important. You know, these three tools, these three energies, if we know how to harmonize, align, this three energy, it becomes the simple smile becomes sometimes one of the most, most powerful. Just imagine as a business people that we invest hundreds and thousands of dollars to buy a device or software and we don't use them properly. Of course, the boss is gonna scream. This is a waste of investment. We spend so much money to buy this software and this devices, see now we are not, most people are not using it, but can, you, can we think that we have this amazing three tools, heart, mind, and body? How often we think it, even as a business, yes, when we go get ready to go job, of course we will take shower, we will brush, we don't want to stink, we will put nice shirt, pants, we will coordinate color coordination, best you want to look, you want to present the best of well, the best version of you. And then the true best is 
hidden inside those suit, those pants and clothes. People can see that. Moment you wear the expensive suit, you go. If your three tools, the energy, heart, mind, and body is not aligned, then people can see through that. It doesn't matter even you wear the expensive suit. Even you wear a simple kurta pajama, but your three tools of body, heart, minds are really well harmonized. They are aligned. And when you smile, you can smile from your heart. You could see your body, your face smile, and your, you can smile from heart, mind, and body. And that can be such, such a powerful uh, way, 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 way of, uh, uh, way of uh, smiling. Now, uh, Professor Prasad, I, I, I forgot your question. I think I got distracted. I think you have responded to the question, sir. <laughs> I think you have responded to the question extremely well again. And again, you have centered it. You have centered the question on the being. I think what you have mentioned is, if I have to connect back, is that you can transform if it is not only knowing, it is not only doing, it has to be knowing, doing, and being in all the heart, mind, and the body need to be together. And I think you illustrated it extremely well with the example of a smile. And of course, the same application goes for everything else. Thank you, sir. I think it was a beautiful response. Sir, the next question. When you undertake this uh, mission of transformative learning, and you would have had a lot of experiences in doing so, uh, what sort of uh, challenges have you seen in integration of the body, the mind, and the heart. And uh, you have, there have been a lot of questions. How do you do it in school? How do you do it with maths? How do you do it in, uh, you know, higher level of education? How do you do it with uh, people who are working? So the contexts are many. But what kind of challenges? You would have seen a number of settings in your travels when you're doing this. So what sort of challenges do you see impeding this, which will inform us in our own context for trying to improve and see how we can integrate better? That's the setting of the question, sir. What has been your experience on the challenges? I think the biggest, still is, the biggest challenge is human's mindset. Our mind is very rigid. I think this is, this is due to one of, uh, I think, our, again, the way we were educated. We were, you know, the education system we have is a, it's, it's basically so rigid and we cannot uh, think and go beyond, you know, although that we emphasize, I think the definition of the modern education system is so rigid. The, the purpose of modern education system is only to actually uh, the, maybe the highest goal we can think of is the economic gain and basically turning human beings for the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the servant or the, the labor, uh, turning into a labor to achieve this ultimate goal of, 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 of the, you know, the money or the wealth. I think because it is created in a such a way, uh, this, this two factors, the fear and greed. You know, we, 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 are, we are trapped by this fear and greed. The greed of just, you know, having more and never uh, becoming content and never achieving the true, the happiness we are looking for, always being kind of like, hungry and craving is this restless craving for bigger and more and 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 you know the nicer uh, uh, I want to achieve and then fear which is placing huge of that you know what if I don't get this what if I don't have this I think uh, we need to we need to learn to live life and I think we need to learn that Edu we need to get out of this, this, this mindset. Uh, 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 there's a much more than money. Um, of course, the money plays a big role in this. Of course, the money, uh, money has definitely has a space to make things happen. 
But I think that we as a human needs to uh, see the bigger picture. Otherwise, I think eventually this mindset will lead us to ultimate destruction of entire planet. I'm not talking about one planet. We could see the, you know, the individuals destroying their life for this ambitious, this greed and game of this greed and fear. You know, it's never, it's never, never going to achieve. I mean, think about us, take our own examples, like happiness, uh, uh, the achievement is always a far, 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 way far away. It's never, never, nobody achieved this. You know, you think about the happiness. I think of, you know, when we are in a school, we think, okay, I will be really happy if uh, when I finish my high school and we forget to ask people who already complete the high school, are you happy? We forget us, then we, we complete the high school. Then we say, okay, I will be really happy and a peaceful and amazing person if I get into this college. Then we forget to ask, you know, who, who got already got into that college and completed college. And we just keep chasing that, keep chasing, it, you know. And then, oh, finally, oh, if I get a great job and wife or husband and two children, then I will be really happy. And then again, you know, the stupid thing is we, we forgot to ask people who already have a job, finish the high school, college, a good, decent job, have a wife, husband, and children, are you happy? Then finally, we will say, no, no, if I get to retire, I will be really happy. Then we retire, then we keep chasing, keep chasing. And I think, we need to learn how to enjoy the process. How to enjoy the process. It is it's okay to have an ambitious goal. I don't blame that, it's ambitious goal. But I think the problem is where our attitude, where we look at those goals. If we learn to enjoy this process. So what I see the biggest thing for me is uh, the people's mindset the implementing uh, the education, uh, which educating heart, mind, and body is the mindset is one of the most challenges that I face all the time. And even today uh, uh, with my colleagues, with my staff, whenever we talk and it's a, it's a mindset is a, but I think the practicality of this is so simple if people open, that's why so much of unlearning has to happen when we think of preparing the future generation. We cannot build the future generation based on education system and thinking and mindset we have right now. We cannot expect the different future doing the same thing, the century old, same stuff doing and cannot expect a different result. So I think the mindset of adults is a, is a, is a, the biggest obstacle. Thank you, sir. Again, you know, you have you have been uh, you have hit the nail on the head, and you've also responded to one of the queries which has come up from our uh, beloved colleague, Dr. Samyadeep Chapravorty. Uh, so he wanted to know how one can be flexible. I think you have hit the nail on the head, and you've also responded to the question. I think some of the uh, the ways by which you can uh, become more flexible is one is by seeing the bigger picture. And I think sometimes we do this when we get a shock in our life, like somebody passes away, etc. But I think seeing that big, bigger picture <clears throat> when we are living daily lives is even more important. I think another set, another implementable or something that we can actually practice, you said, is enjoy the process. Relax and enjoy the process, whatever you're doing, understand it, enjoy the process. I think you also suggested that we relook at our review, our attitude to goals that we have for ourselves. And you, you, you mentioned that big point about unlearning. I think in a way, the younger generation has very clearly uh, is demonstrating to us that we are not going to listen to you and they do it in so many ways. And I think one of the prime reasons for doing so is that I think the way we have been disciplined and obedient to our elders and followed whatever has been happening in terms of systems, it's not worked. And I think it's very evident to them 
that as far as the world goes, things are not working the way they should be, and therefore they need to be re-looked at. Thank you very much, sir. I think with this, I'll though I have some other questions in this cluster, I'll hand it back to Professor Rao for the next set. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Professor Prasad. Uh, again, Lobsang, uh, I think the interesting part of the discussion is there are several layers to it and it's getting deeper and deeper as you explain. It is sounding more profound uh, at one moment and it is looking simple also, practicable as well at the other. And we are juggling between profundity and simplicity every now and then as you are talking. So we are enjoying this as much as I am enjoying. I'm sure all the participants are also uh, enjoying this. They're lapping it up. Sir, I will focus on a few questions uh, for want of time. Uh, these questions are more on application oriented uh, questions. And uh, for example, you have uh, embarked on a journey which is which is extremely noble, which is how hugely useful for variety of communities uh, that you deal with and you integrate them into your folds and you teach them a new education system and make them actually uh, highly, uh, highly result oriented and highly successful apart from you know, integrating the heart, mind and the body in terms of being successful in a wholesome way. But sir, one question is that uh, when you integrate the students from dysfunctional families into the school ecosystem, especially in a day school, there are challenges. Uh, how do we, how do, what is your suggestion? How do we go about it? How do we integrate children from dysfunctional families, especially in day schools? I think the most, two most important thing I talk to the educators, whether you're educators, where you are leaders, where you are, whatever you do, if you, you know, we all have somebody in our life that we fail sometimes to give up you know, and we feel that, uh, no, this is not gonna change. Number one is, of course, the patience, you must. Have. Number two is actually faith. It is important to have a faith. And number three is when you have a faith and when you have a patience, then you can hold the space for that person. And if we make sure that from our side, this three, the components are there while the, the struggling person exists uh, or, or is, is a presence in your, your family or in, in, in your, your, your campus. You know, this three ingredients, ingredients is a very important. I talk about the educating and healing is so much as the, the farmer's mindset, you know, uh, that's why the name itself of our community is Jamse Gasal, means the garden of love and compassion. Reason is every human being, every child is a seed of, seed of compassion and love. It means they have a potential to heal themselves and they have a potential to heal everybody who's around them in the world, if we can give them a chance to heal them. And they have potential with that. We do not need to become obsessed and stressed fixing and, and, and fixing them and, and healing them. And they have a potential to heal themselves. We should have the gardener's mindset where that we have to hold a space with the hope and patience. What the gardener's farmers will do when they plant anything in their farm there are two important qualities you will see. One most important thing is the faith. They would never know what will happen our six, six months later, or they will never know after a year. Maybe like Assam gets flood and it will destroy everything. But what is the most, most important for the farmer is the hope they act and believe and live from future. And that is a simple language that we all, simple uh, the practice or principle we have to uh, practice. We have to act and live from future with the faith. And this is the main reason we are alive today. You know, nobody, you know, we all act and live from that. We need to, when it comes to helping, healing and transforming somebody's life, 
And we need to think, we need to act and live from the future. The farmers will do. They will not doubt. They will not sit and discuss about what will happen, you know, two months later, three months later. With clear hope, the unshakable, unwavering hope that they will do all the preparation necessary with the hope and faith to have the best harvest at the end of the year. And then second thing, what they do every day, they live, practice patience. The patience is a practice. The farmers make that priority. Every educator, every parent, every business letter have to make the patience is a practice and we must make that is a number one priority in any situation. Now farmers, they plant, they made all, of, all the preparations and they wait every day, every moment, they practice a patience, they practice a patience. And that way that when we hold the space for them and they will heal themselves and they will transform themselves. Well, nobody, we are nobody today. That's why the plant, when you make the right conducive environment, when you make sure the soil is fertile, it has provided all the, what do you call the, uh, 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 you know, the necessary things provided, the plant can heal itself and plant can actually grow. You know, it will go, grow to the, their, their highest potential. So this is a, something that, why, why we call the Jamsega, uh, so the garden of love and uh, uh, compassion. Awesome. Actually, it is mind blowing when you have explained this concept of uh, gardener's uh, perspective, gardener's mindset uh, in terms of nurturing, in terms of actually integrating children into an ecosystem of education. Uh, I think it's very, very, very profound and deep in terms of uh, how we do it. We don't, we don't think and talk about healing them or trying to correct them but create an ecosystem and environment in which they heal themselves and they have greater potential to heal everyone around us. I think that's awesome. The words can be replaced. The heal word can be replaced with help. It can be uh, additionally substituted with any other purpose, even if it is related to economic goals. I think if the environment and ecosystem is created by the leaders around us, the leaders within us, I'm sure, we will be able to help them uh, uh, be part of this thing. How do we cultivate faith? How do we nurture patience? And how do we create space for others? These are not simple words. These are actually having huge application in terms of our day-to-day -day life, in the, in, in the work that we do. Uh, we meet people every day. We try to achieve certain objectives, but when we think through carefully and create the right ecosystem for them to flourish, which is by thinking about them and by creating space for them. I used to say uh, in certain other situations uh, in my own humble uh, methods of learning and probably sharing is that true leaders create space for others on the real estate of their heart and mind. So I think uh, it integrates very well what you have mentioned just now. It's, it's a guru statement that I have seen and learned from you when you responded to this question. So, so thank you very much, uh, Genla. I think uh, fair patience, practice, and, and of course we prioritize this patience as a number one priority in organizations, in business, as well as non-business organizations in our day-to-day -day lives as well. And then other things will fall in place. Thank you so much for that huge answer. Uh, would like to ask you another uh, application-oriented question. What is your suggestion about uh, making government schools more meaningful and value adding to our children? Because you, we've been looking at many communities, you're looking at many locations, both, all types of schools, both government and private, but specifically to government schools, what is your suggestion? How we can make these schools more meaningful and uh, value adding to our children? Thank you, Sir Adam. I think we are actually especially from this year, we are working uh, 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 with many at the government school. And I recently started training the, you know, entire the, uh, the, the government teacher of the district. And our ambition is to go up, uh, you know, to uh, train the entire, uh, the teachers of the entire state. 
And this is the one thing I think we need to educate. We need to help the teachers to unlearn, to relearn, you know, how we could change the, the mindset of, uh, of, uh, uh, of the government teacher. And I think when it comes to, you see, the educating heart and mind is I think now, because it's not, it's not a foreign concept anymore. When we look at the current education system and situation, you know, we have so many graduate unemployed youth in this country. And so many ways that we are talking about, we don't have enough job to give to the, this young man. That I strongly believe, I think we do have enough job, but there is a huge gap between job and skill. I think because the previous education system is focusing on only one, maybe, you know, I'm a little bit exaggerating, but only one thing focusing on that. And there are so many areas that we see that we need the people, we need people to do those things. And there is a huge gap between uh, the available job and skill. You know, when we talk about educating body, and this is exactly another thing I'm talking about, you know, I, I joke a lot about with the people is that, you know, uh, when I see the, the great football players, and they play so well, like, like a king play. And I, I used to watch as a young monk, the football was one of my passion that, you know, like, wow, how could he do this? You know, because he's, uh, the feet are so educated. His feet are so educated and that he could actually make so much money. Now, in, if, if you think this in terms of money making or, or financial gain, and then when I think of somebody who sings so well, you know, how educated their voice are. And same thing with somebody dancing, their hips and their, their whole body. And I could never do that. But so many of these people, you could see, they actually way, they find a way to go out of the existing education system and educate each and every part of, you know, identify their strength, their hidden talent, and then focus on educating that part. So of not only that they will find a way to survive and feed their family, but they actually do so well. And, and it is, many of them do much better than who people who have a degrees from the university where the, I think the 21st century, I, I, I joke about it, the 21st century's beggar will, be, will have so many degrees, but so little skill to survive sometimes. And now another thing, because of artificial intelligence, they already a lot of the human jobs are replaced by the machines, the devices, the, the robots. And people are forced to think Certain skills the robot cannot actually be replaced by the robot. Only humans has to do. Could be the compassion, emotional intelligence. You know that every educated leaders have to think through that in, in a, the, for, for, for future. So the educating heart is not just like previous. We, we think maybe 10 years, 15 years. Oh, is it something to do with the monks or the sadhus or the saints? It's something to do with it. No, not anymore. There are so many research that it is proving that people who have a high emotional intelligence and they do much better than compared to the who has a high level of IQ. The 90%, nearly 90%, the emotional, uh, the, the intelligence, nearly the, the uh, emotional in intelligence counts for the nearly 90% of what the sets high performer from the, uh, well, apart from the, uh, appears with the, the, the technical skills and knowledge. And even when you think from the business perspective, the cultivating compassion, empathy is playing big role, I, I, I think. So for government school, I think we need to educate. We need to educate not only the educators, but we need to educate parents. We need to educate the educators. We need to educate the policymakers, and we need to put a lot of focus on this 
So I, again, go back to the mindset. I think we need to change the mindset of our educators, our policymakers, and parents, because future is actually all about educating heart, mind, and body, not only getting the university degrees. Amazing. Amazing, sir. I think uh, the suggestions are pretty sharp and detailed in terms of what can the government schools can do. We need to change the mindset. We need to change each and every stakeholder in the ecosystem for the schools, like parents, teachers, school management, policy makers, administrators, so on and so forth and focus on not just one overriding concept of economic goal, but focus on various other aspects. The job versus skill gap, which needs to be focused on. The degree versus the ability to survive or the skills to survive in life. I think the latter is something that we need to focus on in order to make sure that the government schools are more meaningful and value adding to our children. That's a fantastic answer, sir. Thank you very much. I will move to the next question with your permission. I will, uh, Sudhakar, I will add one more thing. Sorry, please, I, please. I think this is important. Another thing you see that that certain other, you know, that on somewhere that I saw that in every hour, the more than, you know, one child is committing suicide in our country, mainly as related to the pressure, the education pressure. And I think here that again, we are talking about when we're talking about regulating and managing uh, emotions, the emotional intelligence. Now the education, current education is number one. It is not even providing a secure job, which is actually self-defeating the purpose of really education, modern education is focusing on. Number two, education is even making people sad and depressed. So the educating heart is again, so important. What emotional education we are talking about, the emotional intelligence we are talking about, self-awareness, the self-management, you know, uh, being aware of, one more, aware of one's own emotion, understanding and un identifying our own weakness and strength and regulating that, managing that. So I think when I talk about three essential educating heart and mind is no more as a luxury. It is now becoming the essential skills. If the educators, policymakers, parents, if we fail to emphasize and teach these three important skills, and I think it will cost so much in the future and we can't even actually uh, uh, bear uh, the, the, the impact of, of not doing this. Sorry, I, I interrupt you. No, no, fantastic, sir. I think uh, the point that you've added is very, very important. Even if we focus on the purported goal of this education to provide jobs, which it is not providing now, will cause so much distress and dissatisfaction, depression. It will probably cause uh, suicides. It will probably cause unrest. And we, we, are, we are looking at some of these cases around us all the time. So the real answer, according to you, is to harness uh, the wholesomeness by educating our heart, mind, and body. Any number of times we repeat the integration of these three vital and essential elements, uh, it is not enough. Because one day, this repetitive uh, citing and talking about heart, mind, and body will translate into our actions. And once we see the results, which we begin to see, we will believe in that. And our belief will beget a greater application of our faith onto these principles. And then the world will become a much better place. I think, I think that's, that's where we are taking this to. Thank you very much, uh, Genla. I will now move to the next question. <clears throat> Uh, one suggestion from you, we request, uh, uh, one of the participants is asking. Uh, I think there are several comments that are there. I think uh, Manova Simeon uh, says the illiterate of the 21st century uh, will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot uh, learn and learn and relearn, uh, as mentioned by Alvin Toffler. This fits very well into what we are discussing currently. Thank you very much for that comment. Uh, one suggestion that we require from you is how can a differently able child, a differently able child, 
how can he be helped in academics through transformative learning? Any any help? Any suggestions on that? Sir? Honestly, I, I I don't know how to answer this, uh, but I I do believe that all of us are in some ways differently disabled, uh, and I think uh, the good good educator, the the compassionate educator could always uh, find the, their best potential and strength in, uh, in a child. And if we could, we could encourage that, encourage that without any adjustment. And, and again, as I said, that we need to educate our eyes and minds what is a good and what is a smartness. And our eyes, our ears, our mind and hearts has to do a lot of unlearning because successful, unsuccessful is also so much of defined and very rigidly what we believe and idea we have in our mind. If we can educate ourselves and do the unlearning, we will see the amazing potentials and so much you know, whatever the uh, especially uh, uh, able, you know, people can contribute so much, so much. And you, but point is like, as I say, uh, like my eyes were so uneducated when my friend showed me amazing piece of artwork. And I think so many of us are even eyes are educated, not able to see the beauty and the strength and the potential of of, of these children. Uh, and I think if we have, if we can change our mindset and able to recognize those, those potentials, uh, I don't know the direct answer, but I, I believe strongly, uh, you know, there's always so much they can offer. Amazing. I will, I will share one, one thing here with you. At Jump State Assault Children's Community, we talk about the three generation, three generation learners or three generation teachers. It means kids, their peers, and then teachers and parents and the grandparents. One of the models that we are changing at Jamsa Gasala policy is whoever comes and serves in our community more than 20, 25 years ago, and that person has a right to live rest of their life in the campus. So we are creating what's called the village, which is right livelihood village, around the 50 household, all sustainable. You know, we are building, we're going to build with the natural resources and waste. So when I first shared this with, if you think about our ancestors, when we were, when humans live in a tribe, our grandparents were the most knowledgeable and they have the, entire wisdom of life. They were Google of our life, you know? And, and every time the villagers, younger generations, then when they face a problem, they go to the older person in the village and seek their advice and guidance, how to handle situation, how to move forward. The modern education or the modern society, I should say, you know, it is taking away and thinking the older people are burden. It is uh, too costly, expensive, and we are actually, we are separating them. And who is gaining is only the business is gaining. Where it is hurting most is our grandchildren and parents. The biggest damage, actually we are hurt, hurt is on the grandchildren and our parents. The gaining actually people who are making this business out of this. Now, people say this is too expensive, uh, love some to, 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 to keep these old people. I said, no, this is a very smart investment. I don't see the grandparents as a burden. You know, if we need to invest them, reason is again our mindset. We don't able to see, we are brainwashed. Once you're 60, retired, you're no more worth. You know, forget about compassion and things, but even from the business perspective, I see these are the real treasure, the wisdom. These are the wisdom that we have in our community because they have a lived experience. Nobody else has this. 
you know, we should not see them about them. So in a Jamsa Kassar, we said, we, we, we invest and we keep them. And then people say, how, who's gonna take care? I said, they are grandchildren, our younger kids. Every day, they will go. One of very important class would be spending two hours with the grandparents. Now we will think, oh, oh they, you take care of the grandparents. You actually, you're not taking care of the grandparents. There is a mutual benefit. When they spend time with the grandparents, we all know experience. Our children change, they glow, they get enriched. You know, instead of paying so much money to find a nanny, which has no connection to the, your culture and the language. And your own grandparents is a, your root. We are sending our younger generation, future generation to the root with the spend time with them. And they learn, the younger children learn how to practice compassion in action, helping, of course, walking with them, sometimes, you know, washing them and sometimes helping them to cook the compassion in practice. At the same time, they are grandchildren, they learn values. They are actually learning to build strong root system when they grew up. And this is what missing in a younger day. I will tell you this story. I met one couple in Singapore, one of my trip, and we'd had a discussion about their children. And they said, you know, how oh, so much difficult, how come my children has no culture now? And there are, uh, uh, you know, the Chinese couple, because they both work and their children, they go to the American school and they have a Philippine nanny. Where do we spend most of the time? They spend maybe eight hours, seven hours, six hours in an American school, which is not Chinese. And they come back and four hours with their nanny who is Philippines. And now the parents is, Parents are expecting their children to grow into Chinese culture. That is very illogical, illogical. And you pay so much money. So why don't we invest, reinvest on our grandparents, see their values. And I think biggest again loss is if you don't do this, biggest loss is our grandchildren. Our children, our grandchildren, uh, may, uh, yeah, our children have a big story. And many of us had this, opportunity and, 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 and fortune to spend time with our grandparents. We know these are memories we will never, never, never forget. And we always would cherish, but the younger generation we are taking away from. But these are something I'm talking about, the mindset. We need to, we need to educate, we need to re-educate. Unlearn and relearn has to happen. Somebody who mentioned, I think, otherwise we all become the most uneducated person of 21st century. Because the 19th century, 18th century, 19th century, 20th century education is already falling apart. It is not, it did not prepare us for the 21st century. And I think we need to get out from that system, unlearn all the uh, things and relearn. And at least for our future generation, for our children or our grandchildren, we need to re unlearn and relearn and prepare them for the brighter and better future that they deserve. So I think mindset is so important. Uh, I'm, I'm actually amazed uh, at the most tangible example that you're given now with uh, what you are practicing at, uh, at uh, Jamse uh, Gatsol community. Uh, that is to create the right livelihood village, sustainable living. But beyond that, the, the, the rooted learning is how we were all getting connected to our grandparents, the good old days of uh, learning from the grandparents, getting schooled in the value systems, learning compassion and various other aspects by observing them and spending time with the grandparents. I think you are recreating that. And that's a very, very huge uh, tangible benefit uh, that makes, and you also say that it makes business sense to actually do it in the sense, all our purposes, all our objectives are well connected. If we have uh, such innovative approaches uh, to, to, to bring back each of the stakeholder to, to their roots of learning. I think here in this case, the kids and their peers, if they're connected to the grandparents, they will learn a lot and that integrating of heart, mind, and body, that harmonization will eventually take better shape.
I think that's a fantastic, fantastic, strong point uh, uh, that we are, we are uh, talking about. There's a huge element of guidance as well as to how we proceed. Uh, I'm very happy and thankful to you, uh, Genla, for that uh, response. Uh, one quick uh, question. I will ask uh, Dr. Sangamitra Patnaik to raise her question herself. We'll open the window for you. But before that, a brief response from uh, Genla I would uh, request is, uh, how do we create balance between technology and learning? The, the world we are witnessing currently has got several compulsions of uh, harnessing the technology at the same time, uh, achieving the objectives of learning. How do we create that right balance between this technology and learning? Yeah, the technology is definitely going to be part of no matter what part of our life. Definitely we cannot uh, actually ignore that. And I think it will also has a lot of uh, the benefits we, we, we ourselves experience. And uh, uh, of course, the way we use it and how we use it actually has to be very, very careful. Otherwise, it will have more uh, damage than, and, and, and benefits to, the, to us. At a Jamsegas of Chile community, we often talk about tech free day or tech free week sometimes, just to completely shut down everything and the uh, and practice, be with, and the human connection, uh, the, the nurturing human connection, and breaking, taking a break from technology. But I also I talk about the simple things about. And not the meditation, but I talk about me dating. Is the similar with the meditation? Me dating, dating with oneself, dating with oneself. So if you find, if you have a, you know, new girlfriend or new boyfriend, I'm sure you will make sure moment you meet that you actually turn up your phone, not even in a put in a silence, and maybe you will even avoid bringing your phone in the middle because this is a, so exciting. You cannot effort to uh, lose that uh, girlfriend or boyfriend. You know, you don't want to get distracted by looking at checking your phone message. I think it is very important for all of us to have the everyday, if possible, dating with oneself, what I call me dating, where one first, the rule is, turn up your phone or do not bring, if you are going walking phone with you and just completely physically be bodily, physically be present with you now, body, heart, mind, and body. And your heart has to be 100% with you and your mind has to be 100% with you. And now practice the me dating, you know, can ye, what we do when we date with somebody, when we meet the new girlfriend or boyfriend, we put the best shirt or best, I mean, pants we have. And we should do this for ourselves. Because you just say, I have a date today. And, and it is, it is the most important date. You cannot have a happy date with your girlfriend if you are not happily dating with yourself. You know, first you need to be happy with yourself. If you're good at happy dating with yourself and you will always have a happy dating with your spouse or even with your, your, your girlfriend, boyfriend. And putting that, and then going to maybe going to walk or maybe going to the restaurant. Don't go with the friends. Just go with yourself, and order the, your favorite food, and just sit with oneself. You know, all three. I said, you know, all body, heart, mind. Be with you. You know, to sit there, and and it's talking nicely about yourself. Say something positive. Think positive and do positive. Okay, here's the third thing. Think positive, say positive, and be positive. And these are something that I, I encourage. If you may not be able to do this, but every day possible, an hour without the phone. Just say, I am, this is my dating time, very important date with myself. So I'm not gonna take my phone. Tell your wife or husband, here's my I'm going to I'm going date with myself. And if you cannot do this every day, like if you could do actually twice, if possible, a week, you could see how it changes 
your life. How, uh, uh, you know, how much the positive impact that you will experience when you, you detach from that. So just don't say the negative, oh, I just, you know, I don't want to use phone or phone. Just say I'm going for a date. You know, you, you're not actually uh, saying negative. Yeah, I have a date. So from yes. this hour to this hour. And something I think we all can do if we set up a uh, certain a discipline, a purpose. Amazing. amazing, amazing. While technology is useful to our, to our lives and work, we also need to practice shutting down and and working on human connections. And that itself is a detox. And one credible, practicable way of uh, doing this is me dating, dating oneself and falling in love with oneself and giving that kind of importance to oneself and thinking, seeing, and being very positive of yourself and your surroundings. It will have the spillover benefits with others. You love yourself, you're compassionate to yourself, you will be in a better position to share that love and compassion with others. It begins with self to start with. Fantastic, sir. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm overjoyed. And I'll now open the mic to Dr. Uh, Patnaik, uh, who would like to ask you a question. Dr. Patnaik is a professor at uh, uh, Kalinga Institute of Social Sciences, uh, Bhubaneswar. Over to you, Dr. Sanamitra. Thank you. Uh, much privilege, sir. Uh, thank you so much. And namaste to the great speaker. And namaste to uh, Professor Sudhakar Rao and Professor Prasad. And um, uh, to just uh, modify, I'm uh, in School of Law in uh, KIT, that is Kalinga Institute of Industrial Technology University. And my, my query is actually the fully answered. But yes, I just want to give my observation that kindly I'm placing this before you. Integration of the heart, mind, and body creates a beautiful symphony to make our learning much pragmatic. That is synchronization of I with we. The real challenge in our field of education is that what we teach or learn only by using mind and heart and body are not integrated. We notice the impact of it in our society today. Could you suggest how can we integrate these three incredible nuances to create harmony in the society? Thank you. Wow, thank you, thank you, Professor uh, Patnai. Wow, this is a uh, this is a great uh, question. See, I I it is sometimes it's very easy for us to implement these things in our, our community because we have a, <laughs> we have a luxury of of, of freedom and uh, to to uh, and and to explore things. We are we are not you know. Uh, nobody is stopping us. And I think in, in, in your situation in the university, and I think this will be uh, definitely a challenge one. And I, I, I think, but again, as I say, is any of you as an educator, first you, if you see there is a purpose of integrating a body, speak, body mind, and heart, and I think there's so many things actually you can explore first, maybe doing in your own family. And which is I did, you know, so all of these are so new to me 17 years before. It was just an idea. It was just an idea in, in my, my mind. And I didn't know how it will go and whether it will work or not. But little things, every time that I get opportunity, I actually try to integrate with even you know sometimes with a small family and sometimes with a small circle of the friends and sometimes even sharing with the you know the different setups we when i visit to the small schools and i think anything that you are trying to do i i don't know if this if this is not a very specific question but i think you will always find a way to do because these are we think again again I, I say it is our education is brainwash us to see everything as a separate entity and we all know it is not separate entity you know there is a relationship between language and math and science and social studies these are not separate entities but we are brainwashed to see that as a separate entity and we have to work and we have to actually go a long way before we can make this, this kind of applicable to the everybody. But somebody has to start this. Now we think that we are forced to see 
our mind, body, heart are totally separate. They are not. And we know this is not, these are part of one system. These are part of one system. You know, so that's why I, again, and honestly, I'm sorry, I don't know how to answer this uh, uh, in, in the right way, but I, I would encourage that, that, you know, you could actually explore a lot and see what, whatever the specific situation you pick up and you try that. You give actually even, you know, you, you guys are smart, you guys are professors, you guys have so much knowledge. I think it wouldn't take much time for you to explore. Uh, to this, this, you know, uh, I, I, I think there's a, always a way. I am also in a process of learning and transform. It's truly been the transformative learning. So many new ideas, I am struggling, and then I take time to explore, and how do I implement this? And how do I integrate this three thing in this situation? Uh, so yeah. sorry for not able to no, answer, no. but thank, thank you for your question. Thank you very much uh, for this loud conversation, uh, Genla. I think uh, uh, while, while sharing your own wisdom, you have also uh, helped us see what are the challenges. And most of it looks like it's difficult to implement. And sometimes it looks very easy to implement as well. If you practice and believe in it so much, I think uh, that's where uh, it is. Um, there is one comment here. How do how does one self overcome self importance? I think it this is a question that has evolved over the period of last say half an hour or so. How do you overcome self importance? The one is to love oneself on one extreme, be filled with love and compassion, so that you are in a potential uh, in in a place to share uh, love and compassion with others. The other extreme is uh, how do we overcome self importance? Uh, Dr. Babu is asking this question. See, the true love to the self is not actually separate from loving others. The true practice of love and compassion, one has to understand the underlying the system of our existence, the interdependence, the system of interdependency. If you truly love yourself, you know, you cannot just ignore the rest. Truly loving yourself is truly loving entire humanity, entire uh, the world. So uh, it doesn't really, again, separate us from the others. Wow, that's again profound. Uh, thank you it's, so much uh, for that. Your uh, loving, loving yourself is not loving, it is not different from loving to your mother. Loving yourself is not different from loving to your grandparents. Great. You know, you are the part of this generation coming from many, 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 many hundred million years ago. And each and every, you know, you are the, 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 the product or the creation of so many grandparents, so many parents who survived, who came to this world in a one-time come. So when you love truly yourself, you're loving entire the gone generation and you're loving entire the future coming generation. And where you exist is, you see, then you could see that you are not the one single entity which exists there separate from everything else. No, you, 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 are, you, you, are, you are connected to that. Great. Loving yourself is loving the entire world around you. It is no different from, uh, from, the, from the union in which you exist and you live. I think uh, true love will only uh, disclose the benefit of taking everyone along with you. I think that's the message. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Genla, for that. But, but I was reading the, some of the transformative leaders who talk about uh, certain techniques and tips when they explain these concepts. Uh, <clears throat> for example, how do we train our, our body? We train our body uh, to understand our body our, ourselves first, like the way uneducated fingers, uneducated feet and all. It is all limited by what we are conditioned to think. That is the starting point. So some of the solutions given by them is to pursue say yoga or play sports and do many other things. Um, sensitizing or exposing oneself to multiple things which, which one did not hitherto pursue. 
So yoga is some one example that they have given where you can understand your body much, much better than you have ever understood it. So yoga integrates the body into your mind and reach. So that is one solution about body. The second one is meditation. We talked about meditation. You talked about me dating. Uh, that, is, that is, again, uh, trying to understand one's own mind much, much better. Uh, and the third one is writing part. That is journaling part or writing part, expressive writing. Uh, you, 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 you sit down and write about what you feel and then you connect with yourself and your thoughts properly. So that is about, that's about integrating heart. I think these are some of the sort of suggestions that we read when we, when we look at these transformative leaders and their solutions. So it, it, it really gels very well. And that's what most of the participants are trying to understand. How much is uh, implementable? How much is practicable? How much we can do? But some of the solutions and the tips that you've given are so simple. And uh, it is laced with belief. It is laced with uh, an immaculate sense of uh, faith in the power of emotional intelligence, for example, which you mentioned that they are more effective and successful compared to those who have higher IQs. If you don't have emotional intelligence, you will probably lose in spite of having higher, uh, uh, higher IQs uh, at your disposal. I think, uh, yes, it is, it is falling in place. It is making greater sense for us. And this discussion has been so worth its while uh, over the last, uh, over the last uh, 106 minutes that we have spoken till now. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, I, would like to, I would like to take your permission uh, to, uh, to conclude this. And uh, what I, we, have, we have lots of other questions also, but we will write to you. We will seek your responses uh, for those questions. Uh, uh, questions are unending. There are various questions about leaders, leadership, women leaders, challenges, um, uh, managing oneself in terms of a plan versus uh, actual result. What are the things that restrict managerial successes? Yes, some of the answers have come from you. We can actually place it very well. Once we do a summary of this conversation, which we will do uh, after a couple of days, we will share with uh, our participants. We will also share with you, sir, so that you can correct us in case uh, if there's anything missing, you can fill the gaps and then we'll make it public after you uh, help us uh, take it forward. No, but this session is something uh, amazing for me and for most of us that uh, those who are busy in our day-to-day -day lives, those who are driven by economic goals, we tend to, uh, we tend to actually align with the already conditioned mind of uh, prioritizing certain things in a skewed manner and ignoring a large part of what is called our heart, mind, and body. It makes no business sense to ignore these even if you were to pursue the economic goals, as you mentioned by you, in every walk of life, as an educator, as a leader, as a parent, as a policy maker, as an administrator, whether we are in government work, whether we are in private work or in a nonprofit work or NGO, I think everywhere we have a greater opportunity of integrating our heart, mind and body ourselves first so that we can tap into greater potential that all of us possess and share the same with the fellow beings, with our colleagues, with our team members, with the citizens around us. And we can make this world a much, much better place. That's a beautiful message uh, that you have uh, given us. You have exhorted us to invest in some of the most important things like sustainable living, invest in grandparents, create them as a force to reckon with to help the younger generation to keep in touch with them and seek value systems they pass on. And then the centuries old systems of uh, human uh, connections and the value systems that we have come across should continue. And your initiative and uh, 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 your interventions of right uh, livelihood village will definitely ensure this. And wherever it is possible, in our own homes, in our own ecosystems, we should plan and definitely take this uh, forward. And above all, the, the most important thing I'll take home is true love, loving oneself truly, it also means loving everyone around us. And these are not two separate ones. For example, if you love yourself, as mentioned by you, 
you're also loving your mother, you're also loving the people around you, loving the people in your village and the society that you live in. That is an amazing uh, uh, transformative learning uh, masterclass that we have had from you, sir. And we cannot thank you enough. Uh, thank you so much. I would also take names of uh, uh, Ms. Vasudha Manchu, who has coordinated seamlessly for making this happen. She's currently in the US. Uh, in spite of uh, odd timings, uh, she has coordinated with us and made this happen. Uh, huge thanks to uh, Ms. Vasudha Manchu. Uh, also to Humaira Farheen uh, for coordinating with us. And, and the third one uh, is uh, uh, Teke Subba, who I troubled a uh, couple of times uh, to ensure that you have received uh, the information that we are sending out on the email. Uh, all these people have contributed immensely to, to making this happen, not just making this happen, but sharing this benefit of your presence and the benefit of your wisdom to all the participants who have joined us on this show, uh, both on Zoom as well as on Facebook Live this evening. Uh, all of us are hugely indebted to you. And truly, the 60th conversation that we are having with a leader like you is full of wise views. Your wisdom has actually strengthened the title of the theme of the whole uh, exercise that we have, we have been doing for the last 60 conversations, more than one year now. I think you, you have given us a reason to celebrate the 60th conversation like this. Uh, again, Lop Sangla, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I yeah. want to, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for your participation, your enthusiastic questions that you have shared at the time of registration. Please continue to do that. Uh, the 61 will happen, the 62 will happen, and the 100 also will happen. Every Friday evening, we will be back with uh, fantastic leaders like uh, Gen Lop Sang Phun Sok next time at 4 p.m. On, uh, uh, on the next Friday, that is uh, 24th of June, we will be back with a leader by the name uh, Dr. Baskar Enaganti. Dr. Baskar is going to talk about a very interesting thing of how we can have online uh, networks which can be useful for social good. What is the potential and precaution? I think uh, it's a very, very nice opportunity for businesses and uh, uh, social entrepreneurs, educators, and everyone to understand how this piece is growing and how we can contribute to it. Because ICFI, as an organization, we are embarking on a special journey called Digital Street. Digital Street is to achieve digital transformation for the street vendors. We have large number of street vendors in this country. Most of them have adopted the UPI, that is, they have adopted the digital payments, but beyond that, how they can improve their businesses, how they can earn more money. If they're earning currently 2000 rupees or 1000 rupees per day, how they can earn 5000 rupees per day by adopting certain digital methods of communication, of harnessing social media, of uh, harnessing their supply chain, small, small supply chains and networks, how this can be very nicely integrated and this benefit can be provided so that overall the people around us grow us and grow very, very meaningfully. I think we look forward to this session on the next Friday at 4 p.m. And I request all of you to join. And uh, as I said ever, we, will, we are hugely thankful to you for your support and contribution. For now, uh, Lop Sang Fun Sok, uh, thank you very much for this uh, time and presence and expertise on transformative learning. We will remember this for a long, long time to come. And we hopefully, most of us, implement the aspects that you have uh, helped us to uh, learn in the sense that we have, we have to try, try and do a lot of unlearning and then relearn. But at least this session, we have picked up most of the aspects and we go home and reflect and probably take it forward for our own benefit in whatever we do. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank, you. Thank you, Professor Prasad. Uh, I'm sure you also enjoyed the conversation uh, like the way uh, everyone is enjoying. Thank you very much for that fantastic stellar opening uh, cluster of questions uh, that you raised and it has set the tone for the entire conversation. Thank you so much.